Let me start by introducing Ken Hammond. Ken, of course, is the author of many books uh, and, of course, loads of articles uh, on uh, China and more generally on the revolutionary tradition. He's professor of East Asian and Global History at New Mexico State University and a member of Pivot to Peace and the Party for Socialism and Liberation. So, Ken, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thanks so much, Radhika. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, we are the day after the anniversary of the founding of the commune. But uh, in some ways, that's kind of appropriate because this is this would have been the first day when the the proletariat of Paris, uh, you know, got up and embraced a new revolutionary moment, a new moment of, of empowerment, a new moment of adventure, experimentation, launching into a world that that had not previously uh, you know been even even possible to think of what i want to do in in the time that i have here is 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 a few things i'm going to start i know it's probably a little bit you know redundant for this audience but i want to start by reviewing just a little bit about the commune itself the historical experience of the commune and then i want to think a little bit about the the way in which the commune has been understood, perceived, appreciated, uh, particularly, uh, of course, by Lenin, and from my own from my own work uh, in China, because the Paris Commune has served as a great inspiration, as a great source of experience and insight both in the sense of, of its achievements and also in the sense of its challenges and, and the things which, which, you know, of course, as we all know, brought it down. Uh, this was not, you know, the, the proletariat of Paris did not create uh, the, the socialist society of the future that we all work for and aim for. Uh, and so we need to, we need to need, think about what are the lessons that we can draw from this historical experience? So the context, of course, for the Paris Commune was the war that took place uh, between France and Prussia, the, the newly unifying force in Germany that breaks out in September of 1870. And that war does not go well for France. France, the French government under Louis-Auguste Thiers, thought that uh, they were going to teach the Prussians a lesson. Uh, and instead, things turned out really rather, rather differently. Uh, the, the French army was humiliated by the Prussians. Uh, the, the French leadership, even Louis Auguste Thiers himself, uh, and, and the leaders of the French government were humiliated. And in a very short time, uh, Prussian armies came into to France and threatened the very occupation of the city of Paris itself. That's sort of the background that sets up this moment in the spring of 1871. The French government, the, the government, the bourgeois government of, of the Republic, uh, and, and, and it's important to understand that right away on, on the 4th of September of 1870, a Republic was established in France. A republic which, as Marx talks about, was embraced by the, the working people. Uh, and, and, and for a while, there was this hope of a, of a path forward. But instead, under the leadership of these bourgeois politicians, it turned into a, a capitulationist regime. And they were on the verge, basically, of surrendering Paris to the Prussians. But the people of Paris revolted against that. They, they decided that that was not that was not an acceptable path when the bourgeois government attempted to seize the armaments of the national guard and the national guard in paris was really a, the working class the armed working class in many ways and when they attempted to seize the armaments of the uh, of the national guard this is the moment when the national guard revolts and the, and and the people of paris the working people of paris rise up in solidarity with, uh, with the National Guard. They, they drive the bourgeois politicians and the military out of the city. And 
over about a, uh, another week between the 18th of March, 1871, and the 26th of March, there's a, there's a very chaotic period where everybody's trying to figure out basically what's, what's going to happen, what are they going to do. On the 26th of March, 1871, an election was held, a general election was held uh, in Paris to constitute a new revolutionary government of the city, uh, of the commune. Uh, and the hope was, uh, the inspiration was, that this would become the model, the, the, the template that would be embraced across the country. And in fact, that, that does happen in, in a number of other places around, around France. But what happens in Paris is that a commune is elected. And it's elected by uh, a, a very expansive franchise, a, a general franchise, although it's a franchise of men. It, women did not vote in the, in the election of the 26th of March. Uh, but things were certainly moving in that direction. And the women of Paris played a very prominent and very revolutionary role in the creation and the, and the, the functioning of the commune. But the commune is established by this general referendum. This general election takes place on the 26th of March. When Marx writes about this in the Civil War in France, he this is a moment where he criticizes actually the commune because he says what they should have done right away was to march on Versailles where the bourgeois government was basically on the ropes. And they didn't do that. They devoted themselves to trying to address the situation in Paris, trying to deal with the very, very significant and severe needs of the working people of Paris. The, the Paris Commune was a, a political organization, a political experiment of the working class. It was the proletariat of Paris that were the, the key players, the key component of this. Initially, when the commune first is elected, petty bourgeois elements, even sort of national patriotic uh, bourgeois elements join in. It is a broad coalition to begin with, but as the weeks go by, uh, many of those uh, non-proletarian elements sort of fall away. And really the essence of the commune is its proletarian nature. And that's something that, that we need to see very, very clearly when we think about the historical experience and its relevance to, to our own times. Marx in his writings about the, the commune sets out a, a very clear set of the achievements, the accomplishments, the things that the, the commune set out to do, many of, many of which they actually implemented. Others were on the agenda, but could not be implemented because of the, the conflicts, the struggle simply to survive, which the commune faced. The commune was a, a new form of political organization. And Marx was very clear that when the proletariat goes to seize power, it cannot simply take over the existing instruments of government. It can't simply inherit, in a sense, the, the state as it was constituted because the bourgeois state was created, had evolved, had been developed to pursue the interests of a class. And now a different class was going to be in the position of political authority. So the commune diverged from anything that had previously existed. It united the executive and the legislative powers. It mandated that service in the government, service of the commune was not something that was going to be, I don't know, a political career or something that would enrich the people who occupied offices. The, the officials of the commune, the people who held political responsibility in the commune, were to be paid working men's wages. The commune set about transforming the social and political life of Paris. And we have to when we think back on this, we have to understand exactly what it was they were dealing with. One of the major achievements, major endeavors of the commune was to separate the church and the state. 
And we need to we need to understand that that in 1878, in the spring of 1871, the Catholic Church still had held tremendous political power in France and in, in Paris. So this idea of the separation of the church and state, many of us think of that as, as sort of a, a straightforward, simplistic thing, but it's not. This was a major undertaking of the commune to secularize education, to de, uh, you know, to, 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 to disestablish in a sense the church because the church and the state had been so closely interconnected. There was a question of the judiciary. Uh, you know, the commune, uh, you know, went for the election of judges that the judiciary should be responsible to the people. Of course, one of the key elements in the establishment of the commune was the idea of the imperative mandate. The idea that the officials of the commune were not people who were chosen, as Marx says, in an election where every three or six years, the people chose who what bourgeois element would represent them or so-called represent them. But instead, that people would be elected by the people, individuals would be elected by the people to do particular tasks. And when those tasks were accomplished, when those tasks were completed, then their duties, their responsibilities would, would come to an end. And that if they were not accomplishing the things for which they were elected, they could be recalled. This idea of the recall, the imperative mandate and the recall. These were things that uh, that that were unheard of previously. The idea of of popular sovereignty, not in some abstract sense of representation, but in a very con concrete sense of the implementation of the popular will, the needs, the interests, the imperatives of the working class. The commune said about labor legislation. Uh, you know, when we read about this again, it's it's the sort of thing where you're. You read these measures and you think, oh my God, that's so simple and straightforward, but abolishing, for example, overnight work for journeyman bakers, okay? It, 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 seems, it seems kind of like a minor thing, but it was a major innovation at the time. The idea that, that, that legislation, that regulation by the state would be something that was exercised on behalf of working people, not, not in order to most effectively exploit their labor and extract value from their labor, but to actually protect their interests, to take care of them, to make sure that they were not being completely suppressed and exploited. So the commune is, it is a new moment. It's a moment different from anything that had gone before. Now, as Marx write, writes about the commune, and indeed as, as later later commentators write about it. The fundamental reality was that from the first day, from, from the moment that the commune was proclaimed, they were on the defensive. The, the bourgeois government under, under Thiers set about trying to, I mean, first, I mean, what triggers the establishment of the commune is the efforts by that bourgeois government to take away the power of the people of Paris, to take away the arms of the National Guard. That gets derailed, but that doesn't mean that, that the bourgeoisie is gonna sit back and say, oh, this is fine. So they face a, an onslaught of power from the, 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 the national government, if you will. A national government, a rump government, a government of France, which has already, lie, you know, it already lies prostrate before the Prussian armies. And they mobilize the resources that they have. And indeed, the Prussians release their, their prisoners of war, uh, more than 100,000, <laughs> to come back and join the army trying to suppress the commune. What's amazing is how long the commune is actually able to sustain itself because they face daily attacks, daily assaults from the bourgeois government. One of the key measures of the commune that plays out while these attacks by the, by the bourgeois government are taking place was the confiscation, the, the nationalization, if you will, 
of abandoned factories and workshops. And this is when it really one of the key elements in the, in the, in the, in the social program, uh, the political program, the social program of the commune. Because the idea was that productive facilities, productive capabilities, which had been given up by their owners, by, their, by the, uh, the exploiters of labor, were lying used, unused, were lying fallow, if you will. And the commune set about taking over those facilities and empowering workers to bring those back into production so that resources, economic resources, the wealth that the working class creates every day could be expanded, could be enhanced. Those efforts faltered, those efforts could never be fully implemented, but that's really one of the key initiatives, one of the key uh, enterprises, if you will, uh, that the commune pursued. And maybe the, maybe, maybe the final thing that I'll just say about the actual practice of the commune was that, you know, these days we hear a lot about uh, uh, the idea of transparency, the idea that uh, that political processes should be should be open, you know, to the people who are affected by them. The commune published every day the the its proceedings, right? The commune was was not a government that was put in place in an election and then it went about and did its business, you know, and people could just wait for the next time that they could have a chance to vote. The commune was deeply, deeply integrated into the lives of the working people of Paris. And they published their proceedings, they published the transcripts of their meetings, of the decisions that they made. This was, this was a, a moment of engagement. And I think that's the most important thing, that, that the working class cannot simply, as, as again, as I already said, cannot simply take over the existing instruments of the government, but it has to reshape them, it has to recreate them in ways that 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 draw in, that engage and and empower the act, the activism and and you know the ideas, the the ideals and the dreams and the and the goals and objectives of working class power. But as we know, the reality was that over the period between the 18th of March and the 28th of uh, May. The commune was always on the defensive. It was always resisting the power of the bourgeois state. That power grew and grew. The, the bourgeoisie, you know, they had the ascendancy. And eventually by the week of the 21st to the 28th of May, this was the final showdown. This was the massacre uh, that, that drove the commune out of existence. 30,000 or so people were killed outright. 45,000 people were arrested, many of whom faced execution while in custody. Many others fled into exile who, if they were able to escape from Paris. The suppression of the commune, you know, was one of the great crimes of history. But the legacy of the commune, the lessons to be learned from the commune, those are what remained with us. And of course, you know, the, we all know that, that uh, Marx, uh, the, the international had, had, had written a couple of addresses about the Franco-Prussian War. And then Marx wrote the Civil War in France to sum up his understanding and his analysis of the lessons to be learned from the commune. And he was, he was very clear-eyed about it. He saw it as this amazing, exhilarating social experiment. But he also recognized that, that it was in a sense sort of doomed from the start because of the material conditions, because of the political realities that even, even the empowered proletariat of Paris faced, that it was always gonna be militarily the losers, militarily the weaker side, that all the things they did, and they accomplished these great experiments, these great innovations, they set a pattern, they laid down a template that later people could, could build on, but that the commune, you know, made mistakes. He doesn't valorize it, he doesn't lionize the commune. 
He say, talks about the mistakes they made, not marching on Versailles, not building up the, the, the military power to try to resist. Basically, one of the lessons, and, and Lenin talks about this, I'll talk about that in just a moment. The commune was the armed proletariat. The commune was not a government that had an army of its own that had a little special body of armed men, but it was the working class empowered. And so on the one hand, that was a great accomplishment. That was a great step forward, but it also meant that the organization of resistance faced some limitations and faced some, some weaknesses. And ultimately, of course, that's, that's what was overcome. In 1911, on the 40th anniversary of the commune, Lenin wrote an essay. And in that, he, he set out, I think, what are some very important lessons. He talked about the idea that for the victory of the social revolution, there were two essential conditions, two conditions that were necessary. One was the high development of productive forces. The idea that the economy had already reached a high level of productive capability. The other had to do with the preparedness of the proletariat to seize power. And Lenin, Lenin casts a very stark judgment. He says, neither of these was present in 1871. He talks about the achievements of the Paris Commune, goes over a lot of what we've already talked about here. He, he lays out the, the, the empowerment of the working class, the idea he talks, of, he's very clear on the idea that, that at first, petty bourgeois and even patriotic bourgeois elements supported the commune, but that as the struggle went forward, many of those elements fell to the side. And ultimately the commune was essentially and purely a proletarian endeavor. That's a wonderful thing, but it also meant that because the proletariat of Paris you know, was kind of making it up as it went along. This was an initial experiment and it was overwhelmed by the power of the bourgeois state in France. The working class of Paris, the working class of France was still not at a level, a sufficient level of political development, political awareness to allow the commune to achieve the things that it needed to achieve in order to survive. You know, I mean, I, I think realistically, it's hard to imagine how the proletariat of a single city in the context of late 19th century Europe could have prevailed. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's a, an existential endeavor in some ways. Lenin talks about the suppression of the commune, but then at the end of his essay, and, and of course, Lenin writes about the commune in, in many different contexts. But in this wonderful essay on the 40th anniversary, he emphasizes something that I think is really important about the commune, which is that it was not simply something that belonged to the working class of Paris. It's not just about revolution in this city, revolution by these people, but that it had become an inspiration. The Paris commune was the inheritance, the legacy, the inspiration of working people everywhere in the world, that people could, could draw on the lessons of the commune, could feel the strength, the power, the energy of those workers in ways that, that could drive their own revolutionary movements forward. And of course, 1911 in Russia, this was not, this was not a great moment. This was not a moment when the working class was on the verge of seizing power. This was a moment where people were kind of hunkering down for the long haul. And yet what Lenin says is, we look back to the commune, we see what they accomplished, we see the dreams, the hopes, the vision of a future, a just and equitable future for the proletariat. We see that and we draw inspiration from that. We understand that it, it failed, it was defeated, it was crushed but we draw inspiration from it. 
Now, for me, I'm a historian. I'm a historian of China. I began to be really engaged in my own political activism back in the in the 1960s, and part of that was hearing about even through the you know the distortions of the bourgeois media, hearing about the revolution in China, hearing about the cultural revolution in China. And one of the things that that I heard at that time. 1966, 1967, was the idea that in China, a country on the other side of the planet, a country in many ways, you know, so different, so far away, that the legacy of the Paris Commune had this, had this incredible inspirational power. So I just the last few things I want to say here are, are to, to just reflect on the experience of China and a little bit about the legacy of, of all this for, for our moment today. The Paris Commune was a subject of, of study in China. It was a subject that people wrote about and talked about. In 1963, uh, a comrade named Li Shu wrote an essay on the lessons of the Paris Commune. And what Li Xu said was that for China, for the revolutionary path of China, the Paris Commune was just as important as the lessons of the Russian Revolution. China, of course, through the 50s and even to some extent into the early 60s had a very close relationship with the Soviet Union. The inspiration of Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution was very powerful in China. But Li Xu writes about Paris and this idea of the direct empowerment of the working class as something that, that was, was relevant, was meaningful, that, that Chinese revolutionaries, the, the party, the people should pay attention to. It's interesting, Chairman Mao wrote about the commune a number of times. He, he mentions it in a number of writings all the way back in the 1950s. But in general, for a while, he was rather critical of the commune, of, of the what were the historical lessons to be drawn from the commune. And he emphasized in his writings in the 50s and even in the early 60s, the challenges, the problems that the commune faced. But, as Mao himself and others in China became increasingly concerned about the questions of bureaucratization and the challenges of keeping the revolution and the leadership of the revolution embodied in the Communist Party in a, a live dynamic relationship with the people, commune began to take on greater significance. In March of 1966, when the Cultural Revolution was revving up, a comrade named Zheng Jiusi, on the 95th anniversary of the Paris Commune, wrote, a, wrote an essay, Great Lessons of the Paris Commune, in which he, he emphasized the, these ideas of direct proletarian democracy, the idea that the commune seized power and didn't simply set up a new representative government, a new government that was elected and then went about its business, but instead upheld the ideal of a government that was directly connected, was deeply engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with the needs and the interests and the participation of the people, of the working class. These ideas, found a lot of resonance in the turbulence of 1966. In August of 1966, there was a, an editorial published uh, that was in a number of venues, most particularly in Hongqi, Red Flag, the, the ideological journal of the party, called the General Election System of the Paris Commune. And it was a, it was a study of the idea that the commune was directed, uh, elected, I'm sorry, by by a broad franchise, and again, not 
not embracing, you know, women voting, but a universal franchise of men. And that it was, it could serve as a model of participation, of engagement, not in the sense of, here's my vote, you go about your business, I'll see you in four years, but of, here's the mandate, here's what you need to do, here's the tasks that we face, let's get them done. Also in August of 66, of course, Chairman Mao, as the Cultural Revolution was revving up, wrote his big character poster, his Dadzabao, at uh, Beijing University, Peking University. And in that he said, he explicitly invoked the image of the Paris Commune. He said that what they were doing, what the Cultural Revolution was attempting to do was to create a new Paris Commune for the 1960s, you know, for the present moment. Other leaders, Chan Boda, who was one of the great ideological thinkers at that point in the Cultural Revolution, wrote extensive essays about the Paris Commune. This model, this ideal, was studied all over the country. People engaged in, you know, they read the Civil War in France, they read Lissagetti's history of the Commune that was translated into Chinese at that time. And this, the energy of this is built bit by bit through the fall of 66 and into the new year of 1967. On the 31st of January of 1967, there was an editorial again published uh, in the People's Daily and in, in a few other uh, outlets holding high this banner of the Paris Commune. And of course, what happens just a week later was the establishment of a commune in Shanghai. The Shanghai Commune doesn't get, I think, <laughs> the attention that it deserves because this was a moment. This was a, a moment that I don't think has, has come again since then when mass organizations in Paris, it, no, I'm sorry, in Shanghai, <laughs> mass organizations in Shanghai, organizations of workers from the factories, from the docks, from the rail yards, two million people marched to the center of the city and proclaimed the establishment of a direct proletarian democracy. They set up what they called a new Paris Commune. When the, when the, uh, uh, when the commune, the Shanghai Commune was elected on the 6th of February, 1967, they explicitly said, this is a new Paris Commune. So the the, the image, the lessons, the inspiration of the communes was directly invoked at that point. Now, the, the Shanghai Commune lasted much less time than the Paris Commune did. Only a few weeks. It was disbanded at the end of February. And, you know, new forms of political organization uh, came into being, what were called the Revolutionary Committees, the three-in-one combination, the party, the army, and the masses. That's a whole downstream process, and, and we don't need to go through all of that at this point. I think many of us are familiar with that itself. But that doesn't mean that the inspiration of the Paris Commune disappeared. In, in 1971, on the centenary of the Commune, in the People's Republic, uh, the, there was a reissue of the, the, uh, the collected texts, the collected writings about the commune, editorials in the major papers talking about defending the principles of the Paris commune. These ideals persisted. And in many ways, they're, they're still there in China today. You know, we can at some other point talk about the particularities of the Chinese revolution today. Their long and ongoing quest for building a socialist future. But the inspiration of the Paris Commune, the lessons of the Paris Commune, they're not lost, they're not forgotten. So, you know, we have Marx, we have Lenin, we have China. These analyses, these, these attempts to draw the lessons, to understand what happened, why, how great it was, but also what the problems were, what the shortcomings were, how it did not succeed, obviously. 
So what does this have to do with us today? You know, here we are, 2023. We find ourselves, oh my God, in a, in a deepening crisis. Well, in a number of deepening crises, you know, here in the United States where I am, in Europe, other parts of the world, we are in a moment of great transition. We're in a moment of the decline, but not yet the fall of American imperialism, of Western imperialism, a system of global dominance that has persisted through the 19th and 20th centuries is on the way out. But this, like the situation in France in the spring of 1871, it's a moment of promise and a moment of tremendous danger. And it's a moment when the power, and it's an unbelievable power of the working class needs to be mobilized, needs to be awakened because that's the only path which will take us forward. It's the only path which will see off the imperialist order, which will help us in the struggle to preserve life on the planet and which in a more immediate and concrete way may help us to avoid a third world war, a terrible conflagration that would destroy billions of us, right? We face a moment of deep existential crisis. And I know for me, and I think for probably everybody who's here now, when we think about the Paris Commune, we think about stepping up, you know, about seizing the moment, about saying, we're going to try and make a difference. We're going to try and build a better world, a world that is just, that is equitable, a world where the wealth that we produce is shared among us and not siphoned off, you know, to the yachts and the indulgences of the bourgeoisie. It is possible. It's a long and winding road, but we can look back at our history and say, this can be done. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.